market, two or three weeks ago, I forget. We were down at Farmer's Market, and uh, we went to, I forget what the name of the restaurant was, but we waited and waited, and the only seating that we could find was outside, and we waited for that, and one couple, we could tell they were getting done, so we went over and hovered. If you've ever done that, waiting for a table, we hovered for a while. And sure enough, they finished up, and then they left, so we took that table that we'd been waiting for quite a while. So we were sitting there and waiting for the waitress to wait on us, and we started hearing a voice. And it was the voice of uh, Bruce Day uh, as he was singing someplace else. We, we didn't know where he was singing, but we could hear it downtown. And we said, that's Bruce singing. And so the choice was, do we leave this Cadillac of a table that we waited for and go greet Bruce, or do we, do we leave it or do we stay? Right? And so uh, Ray made me go, and so we went. <laughs> And uh, we saw Bruce uh, singing at another place. We had to give up our table. Great sacrifice, right? Sometimes in following the voice of the Lord, we do have to, big time, real sacrifices sometimes that we go through. Kingdom builders, uh, we're learning, is about yielding to God. Sometimes we use the word obey. That sounds kind of heavy. It's really a matter of yielding. Yielding our will to the will of God. But there's a reason we do that. So when you read this aloud with me, this has sort of become our thesis. Kingdom builders practice daily yielding to God and become currents through whom heaven's unlimited provisions flow. So, we talked about yielding last week and unpacked that a little bit. Uh, we began looking at principles of the kingdom. And the reason that's important is that we learn that as we discover these principles, it helps us align better with God's flow in His kingdom through our lives. And I used the example last week. It would be like uh, becoming an apprentice for a master builder or a master musician or a financier. And they would, you would show up on the job site or wherever you were going to be, and that's yielding. But there's a step or two more than that. There's a layered depth that is beyond that. And now that's when the mentor... Uh, teaches you as the mentoree the tools of the trade. And so Jesus, as our mentor, the one to whom we have become apprentices, has given us kingdom principles. And I think we're to learn these principles, and as we learn them and align with God in a more effective way, then we become parents through whom heaven's unlimited provisions can, can flow. So last week we looked at principle number one in Kingdom Builders, which was planting and harvesting. This week, I want to look at principle number two, which is use and growth. Use and growth. That's a pretty simple, pretty simple principle. Um, you've all heard the saying, use it or lose it, right? The simple principle is, those things that we use, we tend to grow in. We become, uh, we have more mastery in. Those things we don't use, and lose. So I used the example two or three weeks ago. If you were to tie your arm to your side and not use it for weeks, months, year, what's going to happen to your arm? Well, it's going to go through a process we call atrophy. Cells are going to decay, and you're going to lose strength and inability for that arm to have any kind of effect. It's just going to be dangling to your side. And so if you don't use it in a way that we've been designed to operate, then it doesn't build up a muscle strength, it doesn't build up muscle memory. And so as we walk in this principle of use and growth, it's really a matter of exerting energy to follow, to apply the Word of God and the presence of God in our life to everyday situations. If I were, uh, if I were, if I couldn't do a push-up, uh, maybe I would have to start down with the kind you do where you're on your knees and you just push up half of your body. And if I, I'd have to start there if I couldn't do a real push-up or a, a push-up. I should say a real push-up for those who do that way. But anyway, uh, but if I do one and I get to where I can do one genuine push-up, then the possibility is real high that I can get to where I can do two. But I have to keep being consistent and maybe every day just do one push-up. And then in a week or so, do two push-ups. What am I doing? I'm beginning to create muscle strength. It's building my muscles up. And I'm creating muscle memory. And I'm creating habits in my life. 
So before you know it, I'm third week, maybe I'm doing three, on up to ten. Uh, Paul Swinton's dad, Jerry Swinton, who preached here a few weeks ago. Jerry uh, was my district superintendent at one time. Jerry's 82. He told me a few weeks ago, he said, I can jump right down on the floor right now and do 20 push-ups. And I wish I'd have said, I'd like to see that. I'd like to go back and do that, Jerry. But I didn't. But, but he's kept in tone. He's kept in shape. He was an 82-year-old man. And so the things you do as you use them, then you become uh, more of a master over it. And you, you grow in strength. It's just a way of, of this principle. You use it, and you grow in that. If you don't use it, then it begins to decay. And the application is not just to your body with things like physical exercise, but it's also to your, to your uh, mind, the things you think about, your, your mental acumen, your exercise in your mind. It has to do with your soul and your spirit. Those things that we use, we tend to grow in. Those things that we don't use, it tends to decay in our lives. So I want to approach this from kind of three different angles as we look at this principle, use and grow. And I want to use uh, the story of the feeding of the 5,000 and then two of Jesus' parables. One of them, the, the two who built, two people who built a house on one bill on the sand, one bill on the rock. And then I want to use the parable of the old wineskins and new wineskins. So let's check out the first scripture passage from the Gospel of Mark as we look at this principle, use and grow. It should be just use and grow, not use and grow, but anyway, that works out. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark chapter 6, thir uh, 38 is in the middle of a, of a miracle that's, that's going to happen where the people who follow Jesus, the multitudes follow Jesus, and they just keep hanging around. And it's getting to be supper time, and you've all had that, we've all experienced that, where maybe someone comes over, and they stay, and they stay, and they stay, and, and your wife kind of gives you that look, and it's getting to be 6 o'clock, do I pull out the hamburger, what, I mean, what do we do? Uh, they're hanging around, and so this crowd is just sort of hanging around. And the disciples said uh, to Jesus, uh, it's time to send him to McDonald's, uh, get some camel burgers, because uh, there's too many for us to do anything with. And Jesus said, would you give them something to eat? And they get this dazed look on their faces, like they were oftentimes to get Jesus, this dazed look. And Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? You see, sometimes we're so aware of what we don't have, that we don't see what we do have, right? Let me say that again. Sometimes we're so focused on what we don't have, that we can't see what we do have. The disciples weren't looking at what they had, they were looking at what they didn't have. They thought, there's no way we can feed all this multitude, there's no way we can do that. And Jesus got their focus not on what they couldn't do, but on what they did have, what they could use as resources. And so this is really, this part of, of using and growing is really about understanding the resources that we do have. Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? He said, go look. My uh, two oldest grandkids, Caden and Michaela, were uh, in Polk City recently where Michael and, and Rachel and his family live, or Michaela lives, and they needed money. And you know, it's awfully easy to always go to parents or grandparents for money, but sometimes you have to teach the kids a different route. And they wanted, uh, uh, one of them wanted some new shoes, and uh, Michaela is also raising money for a mission trip. And so rather than just, just getting it off of their moms, uh, off their parents, or off of us, uh, they began to think, well, what can we do? We're 13. We're not really employable by most places. What can we do? Well, you begin to look at opportunities. They, they just sold their house, but where they still live for a few more weeks, um, Michael and Rachel live on the 13th green tee-off of the TCI golf course. And so, Kayla and Caden reasoned, we've got a stream of customers going right through here all the time. So they went out and they found golf balls that had been lost. They found 40 uh, Pro V1s. Wow. Yeah, exactly. 40 of them. Uh, so they sold those for a buck a piece, which is a great deal for the golfer. I know it. I'll tell them to raise the price next time. And I'll take 10% as their agent. But anyway. So but they had more golf balls than that. They sold golf balls and they set up a lemonade stand. So they were bringing in the money and able to contribute to a mission fund, buy the shoes they were looking for. But the point is, they could have been paralyzed by what they didn't have, but instead they started focusing on the resources they did have. What are the controllables in our lives? 
uh, a young, um, young family I worked with uh, when I was in Eldora. She was a nurse. I think he was a mechanic. And uh, they had more months left over than they did money at the end of it. You ever been there? Where there's more, there's more month than money left. And so she came to my office when we were talking. And um, I just, we, we began to visit about, well, what, what can change? And, and, but here was, here's the thing that struck my eye. She came in uh, with a Starbucks coffee cup. And, which is not a big deal. I mean, you know, who, has, who doesn't like Starbucks? But anyway, I said to her, I said, just, just a, a question for you. How, and this was a specialty coffee. You know, you can get just regular coffee or you can get a specialty coffee. I said, just out of curiosity, how, how often do you get those? She said, well, I get specialty coffee every day on my way to work. And so in my mind, I was doing that. And so real quick, I said to her, you realize uh, that's, you're spending $1,000, over $1,000 a year on coffee. That's $10,000 in a decade. Put that in a mutual fund. You're looking at twenty-five grand in a decade, all if you just make your own coffee and do it on She said, really? I said, yeah, yeah. You've got the fish. You've got five bowls and two fish right here. She just hasn't been thinking about it, right? When I was in Stavanger, which is a friend's church, a Quaker church, I had just gone through um, a, a divorce, and emotionally there were you know, several weeks where it just felt like I'd been knocked uh, off the side of the road. And as I was being restored through that gracious, healing Quaker family and through some key loving friends in my life, just before I met Beret, of course, um, quite some time before I would meet Beret. So I'm a single dad trying to raise two kids and uh, feeling pretty overwhelmed sometimes. But as I got the ground under my feet, so the Holy Spirit was gracious to me. I began to get my breath. Then I began to look at the situation. I've got to tell you, sometimes I get kind of discouraged. I felt like I was stuck here in the middle of nowhere. These were wonderful people, but it was a little rural church in kind of outside of Marshalltown. And I just thought, man, I'm stuck. I've got debt, I've got to get paid off. And then we're, you know, I'm raising kids and all this. And at first I was looking at what I did And then, by God's grace, I started looking at what I did have. Not only two beautiful kids at that time, but, I mean, now I have a third one. I wasn't meaning they aren't beautiful now, but at that time, I just had two. And then, I began to assess the resources I did have. I found out that as a Quaker pastor, I could go to William Penn That's cooperative. You know, you have to be ready to take advantage of opportunity, but it was opportunity. And I had energy. I know that I knew that I had the gift, I had energy, I had creativity, I had I'm not a genius, but I had a good mind. So how can I use this? What can I do with what I have right now? And so that opportunity, uh, a job came open at the Iowa Juvenile Home. Took that, so I'm pastoring full time, but it wasn't a terribly demanding thing. We're talking 70 people, maybe 80 on a good Sunday, and and basically all they wanted was good, solid sermon, priest, and some visitation. That's basically all the church wanted, and they were just wonderful social people. In fact, they didn't want to be a world outreach center. In fact, if you tried to make them a world outreach center, it was going to be like teaching a pig to sing. It was going to frustrate you and irritate the pig, if you know what I'm talking about. So that's just where they were. So, but nonetheless, that became an opportunity. Okay, I can do this. I've done this already for a lot of years, and work 20 hours a week at the juvenile home to make that work. I work 13 hours on Wednesdays and seven hours from 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 five o'clock till midnight on Saturdays. I could do it. We could balance all of this if we needed to, and then go to school full time. And looking back on it, now as a 61 year old, I think, whoa, that was overwhelming. Going to school full time, pastoring, and working at the juvenile home. But it was all working together. I had an energy. God had given me a good mind, uh, uh, the ability to see opportunities, and the ability to work for it. And that all was something God put there. And when I wanted to quit, I cried to God some days I did. I said, Lord, I, I, you're going to have to put the desire in me if I'm supposed to finish this education. And God did. That's the amazing thing. Uh, within a week, I had it there again. It was there. Okay? I can do this by God's grace. 
The point is, I was at first looking at what I didn't have. Then I started looking at what I did have. I had an abundance. I had a supporting church family. I had two wonderful kids. I had energy. I had a good mind. I had creativity. I had the opportunity to take advantage of some things. And so that all became, that extra became kind of just investment type of things to do. All because I began to look at the five loaves and the two fish. So let me ask you, what are your five loaves and two fish that you haven't thought about? It's just been there. I mean, think about it. Maybe the Starbucks coffee. And there's nothing wrong with getting a Starbucks coffee every day if you can afford it. But if you can, that may be your five loaves and two fish. So, okay, I've got to give this up, start making my own coffee, and, you know, save a thousand bucks a year. Whatever it is. But, what are the five loaves? We all have them, we just don't want to see them. Five loaves, two fish. So that's the first part of use and growth. It's really recognizing the resources you do have, but don't be blind to them by looking at the things you don't have. Second thing in this next scripture is in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. And you've got these two guys, and they're both building houses. One's building it on the sand, one's building it on the rock, right? And Jesus' audience, they're getting the drift. Jesus said, those who hear my word and do it, they're like the one on the rock. Uh, the ones who hear my word and don't do it, they're like the one building on the sand. So he said, Matthew 7, 24, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, uses them, flexes his or her muscle, is like a wise person who builds a house on the rock. Now, how can you tell the difference? You know, Jesus was offered a shortcut. He was offered a ministry built on the sand as a temptation when Satan said, if you will bow down and worship me, all the kingdoms of the world that I'm showing you will be yours. That was a shortcut. Jesus was offered to build his house on the sand, and he could have had instant results and no pain. But Jesus understood this principle of, in fact, you know what, one of the definitions of lust is, Lust is wanting in the immediate what God has designed to be in the progressive. What God has designed to be prolonged and, and awaited. That's what lust is. It's, I want it now. I want it now. And rather than this principle of use and growth that we walk in, which is how God has designed it to be most of the time, we just pattern, pattern, line upon line, precept upon precept. So Jesus refused that temptation. And he's giving us an example now. These two men, one guy built his house on the sand. The other guy built his house on the rock. But my question to Ray, I think it was yesterday, was, so how do you know the difference? They both have houses. They both have nice houses. Nice houses. Wait, let's say they built them at about the same time. And the one who built them on the sand, who gets done first? The one who built it on the sand or the one who built it on the rock? The sand, right? Those are, look at his split. And you can't see that there's no foundation. It's just, wow, what a cool house. And you have this other guy digging in the rock. I mean, is there any question where you're going to party? I'm going to party here. This house is done. So this guy, for months and months, before this house ever gets started, other than the foundation, he's, he's having people over. They're partying. It looks awesome. And he says, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Come on over. And this guy's still digging in the rock. And finally, he gets his done. And they're side by side. And they look the same. And how can you tell the difference? I said to Loretta. Right. It's nominal, and here's someone who's built his house on the rock. But how can you tell the difference? You can't until the storm comes. When the storms of life come, you know if it's built on the rock or not. The storms of life came, and the house built on the sand shattered. It just looked the part. The storms came, and the house built on the rocks. Now think about this. Every day this guy is out digging in the rock, picking away in the rock, laying his foundation. He's doing sweat equity. He is exerting spiritual energy. And it's painful sometimes. And he doesn't want to do it. And he just kept doing it. And the energy he exerted, when the storm comes, he doesn't feel a whole lot different. Yes, he grieves. And yes, it can be really difficult. But he's been used to exerting spiritual muscle. It's sort of like, uh, I don't know if any of you follow this kind of stuff, but uh, Jerry Kramer was inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame uh, this, yeah. this last uh, weekend. And Jerry Kramer 
Uh, must be a Packer fan here. Jerry Kramer, <laughs> number 64, um, was most famous for throwing the block against Jeff Roque that allowed number 15, Mark Starr, to go in and win the famous Ice Bowl game. So after all these decades, finally Jerry Kramer is inducted into the Hall of Fame. Well, he wrote a book years ago called Instant Replay that as a kid I read, I know, no figure. Uh, but anyway, I read his book when I was an elementary kid, I think, maybe junior high. And in it, he says this. He said, practices under coach Vince Lombardi were so taxed that by the time the game came, it was like we were coasting now. The game was easy compared to the practice. Well, that's a little bit like building your house on the rock. Because you build up endurance, you deal with some things that are tough daily. You have watchfulness, and you're, you're walking with God, and you're communing with God, and you're digging into some things, and you're resisting temptation, and you're, and you're every day doing this. But then when the storms come, sometimes the storms seem little compared to the daily grind of just being with God. And, you know, I shouldn't say grind, but sometimes it is daily. My grandmother used to say, the only trouble with life is it's just so there is a daily quality. And you don't even realize that, okay, Lord, every day I'm coming before your word, I'm praying, I'm spending time with you, but does it really matter? Yeah, because when the storm comes, you've got something on your feet. One of our uh, members of the 830 service, her name is Judy, and a number of years ago, Judy lost her husband. And she said she went to a grief group, and she realized how hopeless so many people are. Was she grieving her husband's loss? Absolutely. Was she, was she just uh, hurting inside because of his loss? Absolutely. But she said, I realized that my life was built on the rock of Christ. And hearing all these hopeless people, it made her heart just grieve because she built her life on the rock of Jesus Christ. That's how you know the difference. It may look the same, but when the storms of life come, beloved, amen? When you're built on the rock, it's a whole different ball game. So, the two people, two different houses, using and growing involves every day just digging in the rock, laying your foundation, and building a life that stands on something for something. And then the third scripture I want us to look at is from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, again, using and growing, using and growing. Uh, this is where Jesus has been talking to the religious leaders and the people around him. And the, the Pharisees are probably the group that Jesus, ironically, identified with the most theologically, but he was the most brutal with in his words. Uh, and there had been a time when the Pharisees were the new wineskins. They had kept Judaism alive historically, but they reached a time now where they were not continuing to be flexible and to grow with God. They became rigid, and Jesus had brought the new wine and the new covenant, and they were resisting to that. And Jesus said that people do not put new wine into old wine skins. If they do, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. I read uh, a number of years ago about a, a vineyard, um, and a vineyard out, I think, in California, <coughs> if it makes sense. And they had had a historic a family uh, that, uh, that had been in the family for generations. And over the process of time, they built up such a clientele, world famous, they just selling wine and equal clients from all over. But over time, the wooden vats began to decay. And they would notice it a little bit, uh, and they just kept trying to make some subtle changes. And they had experts come in, and they said, well, the problem is, your vats are decaying, you need to get new vats put in here. They said, well, these have been in our family history for generations. We can't do that. I said, well, we're going to keep decaying, you know. And the wine's going to taste bad. And they just kept refusing to change the vats because this is the way we've always done it. And sooner or later, the only ones buying wine from them were family members uh, because they lost all the other business because they refused to deal with that which we had changed. What's in our life? Um, the, the, the family, we have a family tradition of Thanksgiving, like many families do. And there was a family that every year they would cut the ends of the ham off, put it in the roaster, put the roaster in the oven. And I mean, one of the little girls in the family said, uh, Mom, why do we do that? Why do we cut the ends of the ham off before we put it in the roaster and then put it in the oven? And the mother said, well, I don't know, we've just always done it. Maybe Grandma knows. 
So she went to Grandma. She said, Grandma, why is it that we cut the ends off the ham and then put that in the roaster and then we stick it in the oven? And the Grandma said, well, you know, we've just always done it that way. I'm not quite sure. Maybe my mom knows. Ask Great Grandma. So the little girl went to Great Grandma. She said, Great Grandma, why is it that we cut the ends off the ham and put that in the roaster and then in the oven? And the Great Grandma said, well, I don't know why they do it. I did it because my hand was too big. And to fit the roaster, I had to cut the ends off. And they just kept doing it because we've always done it that way before. <laughs> so what are the things in your life that you just keep doing? What are the old wineskins that God is asking you to surrender in order for the new wineskins that can, can, that can receive the new move of God in your life? Because life is made up of a series of constant changes. We don't feel like it's changing constantly, but it is. You know, your skin is replenishing itself like every, what, three to seven days, something like that. All kinds of changes happening at a micro level all the time. Change is just a part of life. And sometimes when, when we become resistive to that, that's one of the things that creates stress in our lives, is we become resistive, we become hardened in the way we want to see life, and we no longer stay flexible. And so we become resentful and bitter because we don't want to keep changing, keep moving. But that's just the nature of life. We have to do that. Life is a series of letting go in order to take hold. Like the trapeze we talked about. You have to eventually let go of this one in order to turn and take hold of this one. And that's just a part of life. So ask in a different way. What trapeze does God say is time to let go in order to take hold? In order to use and to grow? the kingdom of God. The same night that Jesus would give himself, he was really inviting the disciples to a new wineskin. Because this was happening during Passover, and he was going to show them a new one. What's called a new covenant. So he came and took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it. And he said to them, this is my body, given for you. Eat this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. This is the new cup that we share. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for the sins of the world. Drink this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me? We consecrate these elements now, this bread, the body of Christ, this cup, the blood of Christ. We thank you for the new covenant, for the invitation that we now, through Christ, can come into the very holy of holies, the most holy place. We don't need the high priest of Israel anymore to do that. But Lord, through Jesus Christ, our faithful high priest, we come into your very presence. We do it with a sense of awe and reverence and love. We receive now the blessing of this communion table as we remember the sacrifice that you made, Jesus, and the life that you give us as we commune with you. In Christ's name, amen.